I want to talk uh, uh, briefly and give a couple of examples about how um, evidence-based practice is changing in forensic medicine and some of the tasks that are performed in forensic medicine. Um, so just some introductory concepts. I think most of the folks who are probably listening to this understand that forensic comes from uh, the Roman uh, ancient Rome, uh, and uh, uh, typically is referred to as relating to the death of Julius Caesar, who was stabbed to death by a bunch of senators, and um, a, uh, a Roman uh, physician who claimed that he knew um, uh, who it is who had stabbed the, 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 the lethal blow um, was th threatening to give well, testimony in front of the Roman Senate, which was in this set of bu buildings, which is the Roman Forum. Um, the term forensic thus comes from forum, meaning to present in front of a fact finder or in front of uh, somebody who's going to make a, some sort of factual determination based on, on testimony. Um, so our idea of a forum today, of course, is, uh, is the courtroom. Um, but courts uh, are put in the position of having to listen to testimony from experts who come from fields like in forensic science, a uh, wide range of forensic sciences that are highly technical um, and uh, uh, technical fields within forensic medicine, more relating to specific findings about, um, uh, uh, specifically about a, a examination of a decedent or an injured individual. Uh, that can be very technical and be difficult to determine how reliable, how, how good it is, how valid uh, it is. And a good example, what you see here is a picture of, of uh, something that uh, fell under uh, or came under a great deal of scrutiny in the United States, which was bite mark testimony. And in the United States, we had a number of um, very significant convictions that were overturned because of just highly unreliable uh, evidence from uh, uh, experts on bite marks. So that brings up this concept of evidence-based practice. And um, there's a simple way to sort of think of what that is. I mean, evidence-based means that typically there's a, some sort of citation to peer-reviewed literature. Um, that uh, has been adequately synthesized uh, and incorporated into the, uh, the methods that are used. But there's another way to think about it as well, which is to say that um, the methods that you use, you should be able to explain them to somebody else and they should be able to pick up the exact same methods, go out and get the same information that you got and come up with the same result. And so consistency is also an important part of what evidence-based is. It should result in the, this generally the same um, outcome uh, every time or most of the times, because if it doesn't, and we're talking about an opinion that's going to make its way into a forensic setting, into a courtroom, um, you are talking about potentially um, the sporadic justice or sporadic injustice based on the idiosyncrasies of individuals. So when we think about forensic sciences, uh, we think of a relatively high level of reliability and evidence-based practice, gas chromatography. I mean, that's a good example of something that's going to give, it should give the same result every time as long as uh, chain of evidence and the quality of the, the sample that's used um, is maintained. Uh, DNA, uh, that's is, is a, another good example of something that should be repeatable. There certainly are lots of opportunities for contamination. 
And that's really where the uncertainty comes in. But uh, we should all be able to agree on how to interpret, for example, a genetic profile. Um, fingerprinting shouldn't be um, something that is um, that you can't explain to a layperson. It shouldn't have to go through a process that is inside the brain only of the individual who's giving the testimony. That is uh, a, a very different sort of um, situation from how causation or causality is evaluated and determined and opined on. Um, and causation is often a part of forensic medical testimony, but it crosses over into the forensic sciences as well. So what is causation? Well, causation in a, in a forensic setting is something that must be present because it serves as a link. Um, it, so all cases, if you're talking about a criminal investigation or a civil investigation, where there's no criminal penalties, but there are uh, potential monetary penalties um, for a, a negligent action, um, it, you have to show that there has been harm. You have to give evidence that, that a, a person or group of people have been harmed uh, in, in some fashion. There has to be some evidence of it. Um, all cases also require that some evidence that somebody did something wrong is present. Um, if it's criminal, you have to show their criminal action that would, took place. Or if it's civil, you have to show that somebody did something negligent or failed to do something that was uh, that made them negligent. But the thing that leaks the two together has to be a determination of causation. In other words, the wrongful action is the cause of the harm that's been observed. This kind of opinion turns into uh, a probabilistic exercise. So the courts typically require that an expert talking about causation or causality give an opinion to a reasonable degree of certainty, medical certainty or scientific certainty, depending on the uh, discipline. Um, in, in relatively recent years, there has been uh, more attention paid to the fact that this doesn't always really mean what we think it means. So um, out of the National Commission on Forensic Science, which is the was a, 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 a group that was brought together by the Department of Justice in the United States to address um, the kinds of problems in forensic sciences, like uh, the misuse of bite mark uh, testimony, for example, um, agreed that there is no common definition for what a scientific certainty is, and that the term is idiosyncratic. It, can mean, it means something internal. So that goes back to this evidence-based concept I was talking about, where um, how, how do you get someone else to arrive at the same opinion if it is something that you only hold internally? And so this creates confusion, um, which can be, of course, a source of uh, injustice if you're talking about a criminal justice system. So what are the sources of uncertainty um, that we're dealing with? Well, the first big one is that you can't see a cause. It's a unique concept. It's not an observation. And so we, we get it confused with diagnosis when you're talking about a medical setting. You can see a broken leg, for example, on an x-ray, and you can show that to any person and we can all agree that there's a break on an x-ray. Um, it's something that is observed. That's a diagnosis. But a cause is an inference. So for example, if we're talking about the difference between these two x-rays, anybody can see that the x-ray on the left is the one with the broken leg. I mean, a five-year-old child can look at that and say, that person has a broken leg. That's pretty straightforward. That is not something that we're going to disagree on. And there's not really an inference made. But if I tell you, well, this person was in a car crash and the car crash consisted of two impacts. One impact was from the front and the other impact was from the side. And we don't know which crash caused the injury. But I want you 
Mr. Ms. Doctor Expert, Professor Expert, to tell me which crash you think caused it, how would you know? Are you gonna look inside the vehicle? Maybe, um, but if I tell you, for example, that this crash over here on the left causes femur fractures 10 times more often than this crash over here on the right, and of the absence of having anything on board that showed exactly when the femur fracture happened, you're gonna say, well, it's 10 times more likely it's this crash on the left that caused the injury. Now, for some people that starts to make them feel kind of uncomfortable. It's like, I wanna know. But the fact is a cause is not something you know, a cause is something you infer and you assign a probability to. So if we're going to use risk to try to make comparisons and come up with causal determinations, where does risk come from? Well, we know about risk inherently. Um, it's something that we deal with and we're programmed to assess. It's part of our genetic makeup to understand risk and how we survive. But we know about risk with regard to things that are more distant, things that are further away. For example, I mean, I think that we evolved to know what things were risky, things that we could eat, for example, that create a greater risk of illness um, than, than things that created less risk of illness. That's more immediate. But if you look at my example here of people with good cardiovascular health on the left and poor cardiovascular health on the right, everybody knows who's more likely to have a heart attack tomorrow. The diagnosis would be after the heart attack happens. But the risk is which one of these folks is more likely to have a heart attack. We don't know. The guy on the left might be more likely to have a heart attack because of something we can't see. But what we can say is if we take 10,000 people like the guy on the left and 10,000 people like the guy on the right, and we follow them for a, a year or two years or three years or one day, that the guy on the right's more likely to have a heart attack. So how do we know that? We know that because we've studied it with epidemiologic study. Epidemiology refers to the study of populations. We look for people with similar injury or disease characteristics and we find out what happens to them. And then we can make some general characterizations. We can talk about distribution, determinants, deterrence. I can't imagine that there's anybody in the world who doesn't know about epidemiology now because of COVID. But epidemiology is essentially the medicine of populations. And so everything we, when we want to say something about what we found in a person, um, what we observed when we tapped on their reflexes and how they move, that is the medicine of individuals. We make a diagnosis, they have an infection. That is the diagnose. That is that is uh, the medicine of individuals. That's diagnosis. But when we say we're going to give them a certain dose of antibiotic for their sinus infection because we know that that works best, that came from the epidemiology of populations, or excuse me, the medicine of populations, which is epidemiology. Surprisingly, epidemiology or epidemiologic concepts, population-based information, are woven into just about everything you see in, in a, a forensic medical setting. Uh, th th this is, uh, for example, if we're going to say uh, that this man uh, who uh, was found dead after having a fall from a great height and has this terrible unsurvivable um, fracture to his skull. If we're gonna say, oh, epidemiology has nothing to do with that. I mean, it's so obvious what killed him. Well, it's obvious that the injury that he has would have killed him in all circumstances. Is it obvious that that is what killed him? Was he given a untraceable poison that would have killed him at the same point of time or killed him just before he fell? Well, that's not very likely. There's still some concept of epidemiology there, but it, who, who, who's going to, to worry about that sort of thing? That doesn't make any sense. But if you're talking about, for example, uh, a person who's in the hospital who uh, has a pneumonia and they're septic and they get a shot of uh, morphine or Dilaudid, a very strong opiate, uh, 
and then they're left alone and 15 minutes later they come back and they've stopped breathing and they they ultimately die what was the most likely cause of their death they had several things going on there that could have killed them but what's most likely to have killed them now you are talking about the need for epidemiology because you want to know which one had the greatest risk given the amount of time now there is a problem in that we have a knowledge gap between who is making the determinations of causation most commonly those are clinicians typically forensic practitioners so those are the folks who are making the determinations in courts but the people who actually know most about risk are epidemiologists and of course they cross over but understanding the basis for how epidemiology is used and applied in a forensic setting is a unique sort of pursuit. And there is no standardized um, educational model for doing this. And so there's a lot of idiosyncratic practice. The field of forensic epidemiology is a field that um, I teach in. And it's the field that I provide testimony in. This is my field of expertise, which is how in forensic medicine, we use population-based information to say something about individuals. I'll try to make that more clear. Um, I run a PhD program uh, at Maastricht University at the medical school there um, in the Care and Primary Health Research Institute. Maastricht is in the Netherlands, beautiful place. Um, I have uh, five, uh, full-time PhD students, um, and the program is growing. So let me give you a couple of investiga uh, examples of investigations using forensic epidemiology methods. The first one is uh, uh, an infant who, who uh, died um, with uh, intracranial hemorrhage, which was attributed to abusive head trauma. And the second one was a young man who uh, killed himself after uh, being misdispensed a medication. In other words, there was a, uh, he was prescribed one medication and the pharmacy gave him a different one. So abuse of head trauma is a um, type of uh, head trauma seen typically in pre-mobile um, uh, uh, infants, that is, or, or uh, kids who can't walk. So typically it's kids who are under the age of one so that we don't make the assumption that they fell on their own, for example, and hit their head. This used to be called shaken baby syndrome more commonly. That term is still in use, but it is frowned upon more in uh, scientific circles. The diagnosis of abusive head trauma is typically made based on the finding of three clinical uh, diagnostic indicators. One is that there is bleeding inside the head, intracranial hemorrhage, that there is bleeding behind the eye in the retina, and that there's swelling of the brain. This is a very unusual sort of diagnosis in that um, a clinician looks at a child or an infant, finds a diagnosis of these findings, this intracranial hemorrhage, uh, and then says, oh, okay, well, I know how this was caused without actually seeing any evidence of how it was caused. There is an inference that it must have been caused by an abusive mechanism, by, by a mechanism, and that that mechanism was uh, abusive so that there is intent. So it's a very unusual diagnosis. Um, it's not like, uh, for example, gunshot wound where you say, okay, gunshot wound. That could be accidental, it could be suicidal, it could be homicidal. You don't look at the injury itself and actually make a determination of intent. So it's quite unusual in, in that respect. Um, intracranial hemorrhage is the main driving factor here. In other words, you can have intracranial hemorrhage and not have retinal hemorrhage or even or swelling of the brain, the cerebral edema, and the diagnosis of um, abusive head trauma is still made typically when there is no other evidence, there's no fracture or other evidence of external injury. 
the idea or the concept behind this is that um, the child is shaken and that the brain basically rattles around inside the skull uh, and that the bleeding occurs um, from a, 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 a disruption of what are called, called a bridging vessels uh, between the, the covering of the brain and the brain itself. Um, so these are the, uh, uh, the uh, subdural source of subdural bleeds that occurs from these bridging veins which gets stretched as the brain gets rotated. Um, the retinal hemorrhage we were talking about, those are just the little areas of bleeding in the back of the eye that can be seen with an ocular, uh, uh, ocular examination. And then the brain swelling is just, once you have the bleeding, the brain tends to swell. Um, so, this idea about intracranial hemorrhage being an absolute indication of abuse is one that's been examined by a bunch of different authors. Um, this is different from an, a, a battered child where we have fractures or we have all these bruises or we have a known history of abuse. Um, that, that would be considered a battered child syndrome. Um, so a battered child syndrome with intracranial hemorrhage is not the same thing as a child who only has intracranial hemorrhage and no external signs of, of being battered. That is the child that we're talking about here. Um, the use of this triad um, has been used in, in internationally uh, in pediatric circles as being an indication of abuse without the other signs of abuse. So, um, Kids who are uh, diagnosed with abusive head trauma um, are and described in the literature uh, range quite widely. Um, but typically the child who comes to the hospital with, with intracranial hemorrhage and who survives, for example, the child has a seizure, is taken in and then the, um, and then the uh, uh, bleeding subsides um, that's only going to be a pediatrician or a pediatric abuse expert. Um, the ones who see, uh, who are seen in the hospital and then die, typically involve a forensic pathologist and a pediatric abuse expert. And then the ones who die immediately are typically only seen by a forensic pathologist. And they have very different perspectives. Forensic pathologists only see children who are dead. Um, those children look different than children who come to the hospital and survive. So the history of this condition was goes back uh, 150 years. The shaken baby concept was introduced by Guth Kelch uh, in the 1970s, a neurosurgeon. Uh, there are uh, under a thousand publications on the topic. Um, this concept was undertaken by the Swedish forensic pathology um, organization led by Ericsson. Uh, Ericsson was my professor uh, when I studied in uh, Sweden, uh, and he and Lino uh, published a systematic review of the literature to say uh, what kind of evidence basis do we have to say that this is a, uh, a repeatably, reliably uh, diagnosed condition. And what they found is that if you don't have other findings of abuse, those, you know, those broken bones, um, you know, healing or uh, old and healing fractures, that kind of thing, basically the literature is, is quite poor and doesn't really validate the concept of shaken baby syndrome. In other words, if you find a, a, a baby who has an intracranial hemorrhage, that, that alone um, there's not an evidence basis to say that does mean abuse. Um, now, that doesn't mean that we don't have public uh, 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 education campaigns like this one, where we have a a, a big uh, uh, guy. I think he's a I think he is a um, maybe a rugby player from the United Kingdom. Um, I don't know where he's not wearing any clothes but he's holding a baby and he's, they're trying to educate people. Don't shake your baby if you're mad, take a break, don't shake. Uh, because there's this idea that um, 
you know, big guys take these babies and they're mad because they're, they're, they're crying. Um, there's some controversy as to whether or not that even does cause bleeding. The biomechanical community is very split on that. Um, there's a camp that says, no, there's really not enough force to cause the breaking of these bridging vessels without a, an impact. Um, so <clears throat> the assumptions that are in current pediatric abuse practice are that basically you can only get intracranial hemorrhage from two mechanisms. Either you have a, some kind of huge trauma, a high-speed traffic crash, for example, or falling from a two-story building, and I'm not making that up, uh, a fall from a two-story building, or shaking the baby like this. Either it's that or it's something huge, and that there's no in between. For example, if a parent says, I was holding the baby, the baby fell on a carpet, and now the baby isn't responsive, that parent must be lying because you can't get this injury from a short fall. Um, there's another part of the assumption, which is the, if the baby starts, uh, brain starts to bleed, the loss of consciousness is, must be instantaneous. And therefore, whoever saw the baby last must be the perpetrator. In other words, you can't have someone shake the baby and then they give the baby to somebody else and then the baby loses consciousness. Now, um, in, in medicine generally, uh, coming from uh, this concept that there is a basis for practice that is evidence-based, we have something called test accuracy. And if you're in the forensic sciences, you know all about test accuracy. But test accuracy is also applied to diagnostic criteria. So test accuracy refers to determining the true positive rate. So how often does a test correctly identify, uh, does it find an individual with abusive head trauma? If you have 100 babies with abusive head trauma, how often do they have the triad? Um, but equally important is how often does the test get it wrong and incorrectly identify somebody, a child who has not been abused, who also has the triad. So that's the false positive rate. If you um, put that ratio together, I mean, you can have this really fantastic test where it's going to pick up every kid who's got abusive head trauma, which it probably does. If you're gonna say every kid with abusive head trauma, um, excuse me, every kid who has intracranial bleeding um, has abusive head trauma, you're not gonna miss any cases with abusive head trauma. All you have to do is find that there is intracranial hemorrhage. But if half of them didn't have abuse as a cause, then you have a very high false positive to true positive rate. And that ratio between those two is called the likelihood ratio. Um, you can only get that from epidemiologic data. So the way this concept is presented in court, unfortunately, by a lot of experts, is that if the triad is present, there's 100% positive that it's abusive head trauma. And if the triad is absent, then we don't have to worry about abusive head trauma. But because the triad is present, that means this must be abusive head trauma. But if you go to the literature, according to Linu and Erickson, who did this huge review, um, they uh, will tell you that there is um, no evidence to back this up. Now, there's something called pretest probability that needs to be uh, 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 considered as well. Um, and we talked about that earlier. So if there's collateral evidence of abuse, the you know, the, the uh, uh, broken and healing, uh, excuse me, fresh, fresh and healing fractures or bruises or a history of abuse, it's much more likely that a child who's bleeding uh, in the head got that because of abuse. But what if you don't have any of that evidence? What if this is a pristine child who just has intracranial hemorrhage? That is a very important question to ask. You can use a likelihood ratio with a pretest probability uh, in one of these, what's called a nomogram. Um, and uh, those of you in the forensic sciences may be familiar with this. Uh, so for example, um, if, if uh, 
the pretest probability of a, that a child who has uh, no other findings of abuse but intracranial hemorrhage, uh, if, if we take every one of those kids and we say, well, half of them are abused and half of them are not, we would start here on the left at 50%, and then we'd actually go through, we'd use the likelihood ratio to tell us, are we going to increase that, uh, that ratio or are we going to decrease it based on what we know um, about the, the actual data? Well, there is no data out there, which is a problem. Unless you look at the forensic epidemiologic approach, and that's where we actually do find the data. So I'll show you a, a specific case um, where this indeed was what was happened. We've got a classic uh, history, a four month old baby boy who's unresponsive, found by his father who has no history of abuse or anything like that. He has the triad that we talked about. Um, a pediatrician said, oh, this is abusive head trauma and the baby died later. So the man was charged with homicide based only on the allegation by the uh, uh, pediatrician that the findings meant that it must be abuse. What was found later was that the child had an actual coagulopathy, meaning that he had a bleeding disorder. He was missing uh, or, or had a low level of one of the clotting factors, um, which is typically a, a, a familial or genetic uh, condition. Why he was in the hospital? The pediatrician looked at it and said, oh, he must have bled so much that he exhausted this clotting factor selectively over all other clotting factors. Didn't make any sense. Turned out the father also had factor seven deficiency. So we have a very good explanation of why he bled. Didn't stop the pediatrician. The pediatrician said, nope, it's abusive head trauma because of what I heard in a seminar that says, if you find these three findings, that means it's always abuse unless they were in a high-speed car crash, which clearly wasn't there. Um, so uh, the pediatrician gave this, this whole sort of uh, 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 mythology, if you will, that it must have been abusive shaking. It must have happened immediately before the loss of consciousness. If it wasn't a high-speed car crash, uh, then it must have been the shaking. So first of all, uh, the literature can be looked at to find out if this is actually reasonable evidence of abuse. Is loss of consciousness, consciousness always followed, uh, occur following trauma? So looking at the evidence, what we can see um, we had a case series of six children who had traumatic intracranial hemorrhage and also had hemophilia. They had a bleeding disorder. And four out of six of them had no symptoms for 24 hours to seven days after a trauma. So you have to, you, you can't say the loss of consciousness must have been immediate because that's not what the evidence shows. Um, similar findings by uh, a, a number of other papers on the topic showed that when children with bleeding disorders have um, intracranial hemorrhage, um, for example, in one study, uh, there are 46 children who had intracranial hemorrhage, hemorrhage amongst uh, almost 550 children with hemophilia. And between those cases, 18 were spontaneous, just started on their own and 11 resulted from a trauma. So if you look at it as a complete explanation for everything we know about this child, a spontaneous bleed completely explains it without any need to say that there was abuse. Uh, children are more fragile who have coagulopathy. Um, this was found uh, in a study of 433 children. Um, and compared to children, so uh, 105 had bleeding disorders and 328 did not. And if we compare them to look at the number of bruises, we find, let's see if I've got that. 
Well, you can see over here, we have a, a ratio of number of bruises for the kiddos who have the bleeding disorder. Severe bruising occurs almost 32 times more often. What does that mean in a child who's got a coagulopathy and has no bruises? That child is actually very well cared for. Not, in other words, that child is very unlikely to be abused. Um, let's see. Uh, typically abused children have long bone or other fractures. Um, so that to not find them is unusual if you're talking about actual abuse. Same thing with bruises. In order to actually be specific to what this child um, had uh, uh, found, or we had found in these children, um, uh, one of my PhD students and I were involved in a case, in this particular case uh, and did an analysis of national hospital database where we took information from something called the KID, KID inpatient database, which has uh, millions of inpatient uh, 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 hospitalizations described in great detail. Uh, it's a sample of about 20, uh, let's see, no more than that, about 40% of all hospitalizations in the United States. Uh, we combined them and in, came, came up with 40 million hospitalizations. We were able to examine, looked at 15 years of data and we found 9,500 children under the age of one with intracranial hemorrhage and, and retinal hemorrhage. So we were able to look at a very large sample we then looked at the subgroup who had coagulopathy, and we found that of those children, there were 402. So what did we find? Well, we found that almost 53% had no collateral injuries diagnosed. And when there were no other injuries, we found 71% of the time, there was still abuse diagnosed. We don't know how accurate that diagnosis was, but that also means that 29% of the time, there was no abuse. Um, and 79.2, oh, sorry, that's all cases, 70.9. It's higher in the coagulopathy group, the diagnosis of abuse, which was kind of interesting because it makes you wonder why there is a higher rate of abuse amongst children with coagulopathy if it's not completely explained by the fact that abuse is overdiagnosed. In other words, the coagulopathy is a better explanation. But without even in encountering that, we were able to make likelihood ratios. Um, if we use the entire group, we have a likelihood ratio of 2.4. 71% of the time, it's a true positive, but 29% of the time, it's a false positive. And it's 3.8 in the coagulopathy subgroup. So what does that mean? If we start with a pretest probability that uh, there, this child was going to be abused, if we, can, if we say it's just 50-50, we end up with a post-test probability. You can see here, we go from 0.5 through the higher value, 3.8, and we end up, there's an 80% probability of abuse using the, le the most favorable um, value to the prosecution. That means there's a 20% chance of getting it wrong. In a criminal setting, 20% is typically not going to be admissible as to what is, is beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, if we start at a 0.2% though, and we go through the same value, then we end up at a much lower number. Uh, we end up with a 50% probability and even a higher uh, chance that this information never gets to the court. So. Now we've quantified to some extent the probability that the diagnosis of abusive head trauma is correct in this case. And what we find is that it's not sufficiently reliable to put a man in prison for 20 years, which is what this man was facing in the United States. In this particular case, uh, the prosecutor's case uh, was entirely based on the concept of uh, test accuracy that was unproven, unvalidated. Um, and so there was a, a one in five chance of innocence, which is typically insufficient to use as the only piece of evidence that this man committed a crime for which he would be sentenced to a very long uh, prison sentence.
um, beyond a reasonable doubt typically is more than 95% probability. Um, and in some cases it's uh, thought to be 98 or 99%. And what happened in this case was that the case was dismissed. Um, Thank <music> you.